Income tax 2023-2024. Education credit tax software example. Get ready and some coffee because we need to save some money for vacation with income tax preparation. Here we are. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty, to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. In our Form 1040 example problem using Lacert Tax Software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to tax software, it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Standard starting point, Adam Taxman just trying to avoid a dang tax man. He lives in Beverly Hills, 90210. Single filer, no dependents to start off with. We're beginning at the 100,000 W-2 income. Standard deduction for the single filer, 13,850, giving us the taxable income, 86,150, which we can mirror in our income tax formula within Excel. 100,000 income, standard deduction, 13,850, getting us to the taxable income, 86,150. Tax calculated at the 14,266 using the software to calculate that tax, which is on page two of the form 1040. There's the 14,266. We're now looking at education credits, the American Opportunity Credit and the Lifetime Learning Credit. Remembering that the government basically is trying to subsidize the idea of education. And that makes sense from an economic standpoint because if people get educated, then there's more likely to be positive externalities. In other words, if they actually go work and do stuff, we all benefit from the things that they actually produce. And therefore, it kind of makes sense to spend tax dollars basically subsidizing the schools. However, that can kind of backfire, and I think clearly has backfired to some degree, because anytime you subsidize the schools, the schools get to less efficient, right? They're less market driven and more tied to the government. And the schools, I think, have clearly suffered over time. But that's the general idea. So if we have education expenses, those expenses typically are not something that we consider deductible for an income tax purpose because they're going to possibly help us for a new job but they're not really an expense for the current job they're not like something that we had to expend in order to generate revenue which would be the natural thing we would get to deduct if we had a normal income tax system something we could see most clearly on the schedule c where we have expenses that are deducted because they were needed to incur or get the income now, you might be able to deduct, in some cases, education expenses, say, for example, on the Schedule C, but oftentimes, if you can get a credit, it would be more beneficial because although both deductions and credits are good, the credit, if you get a dollar worth of credit, you might be able to get that full dollar of a credit benefit versus if you get a dollar of a deduction, which will basically flow through to the first page, the income statement part of the income tax formula, lowering the taxable income, your actual benefit not being the full dollar, but being based on what kind of tax bracket you are in. Whereas if you get a dollar deduction, you would typically get the full dollar deduction if that deduction was up top and you had enough taxable liability in order to cover it because these these credits, I should say, uh, up top will not take the total tax below zero because these are the non-refundable credits. 
And then down here, if you had a credit down here in the payments area, the refundable credits, you might still get that dollar versus benefit or that dollar credit benefit taking the tax liability below zero, in which case it's not really a tax anymore. The tax code is being used as a benefit welfare safety net type of program. So that's the general outline. Now also just note that when I compare $1 of deduction to $1 of a credit, that's a little too simplified as well because usually when we calculate the credits, there's income phase outs and so on and so forth. So when we talk about the things, the dollars you might have been able to deduct versus the amount that we get to calculate to have the credit, those things will be different oftentimes because calculating the credit will result in a lower amount of the dollars of credits versus the dollars of deductions because of the way the credits are calculated. So it gets a little complex uh, in, in that case, but that's the general idea. Now, if you go to a school of higher education, you're typically going to be receiving a form 1098T. Now, most four-year institutions, if we're talking about college, will of course have these many four-year institutions getting funded, getting payments directly from the government, and therefore the government is going to want information from those institutions to help them out with the tax information. So that's how the government has leverage over the institutions in a similar way as the government has leverage over like people that are employers that want to get a deduction for wages that they pay to the employees. That's why they can force the employers to do this all this work of the W-2s and the withholdings and whatnot, because they're basically saying, if you want the deduction, then you gotta do this. With the education institutions, they're basically saying, if you want our funding, you gotta do this. And even if they're not getting money directly from the government, the, the students are usually getting loans, which are often government funded loans. So once again, the government's going to say, do you want access to these student loans that the students are taking out? Well, then you have to play ball and give us this 1098T. So most institutions you go to, you're going to get some 1098T, which will at least tell you that they went to a qualified institution and they they might have the ability to take some kind of credit or get some tax benefit. Now, the amount that's in the boxes, however, might not exactly match to the amount that you're going to use to calculate the credit because of complications such as things like, is just tuition included in this box or are the materials and whatnot included and what kind of things can we include to calculate the credit, which will differ between the American Opportunity Credit and the Lifetime Learning Credit. We also have complications with scholarships and whatnot, which hopefully are going to be reported down here. So at least we can see the scholarships and grants, which will help us to determine the amount of expenses that we actually paid for. But again, there could be some instances of complications in terms of how they got the scholarship. And you might have some leeway on how you use the scholarships and grants, because if you've got tax-free money over here with the scholarships, then typically you can't use that to calculate your education expenses because you already got a tax benefit because it wasn't included uh, in your income is the idea. So you basically already got a deduction. Now, now you might say, hey, wait a sec, you just said that credits are better than deductions. So if they're trying to help me out, they didn't really help me out because they gave me a deduction when I could have got a credit possibly. There's some nuance to that because because if you're talking about the maximum credit that you can get, it's it caps out at four thousand uh, for the American Opportunity, I believe, and two thousand, or, or I'm sorry, for the expenses that can calculate the credit, four thousand of expenses to get two thousand five hundred of an actual credit, which is fairly low if you're going to school for the entire year. So there's some nuance in terms of being able to take in essence, the deduction or not included in income versus the credit. So those that's a question, though, that, you know, could come up with regards to the scholarships and whether or not we can add that to income, in which case we might get a higher credit than we would have otherwise got by the basically the deduction by not including it in income. So we might touch on that here. All right. So then the general idea, who can take the, the who could have gone to school? In this case, we just have Adam. So Adam, if he's a student, he might have come out of, out of high school and going into college, in which case 
he might be under 24, in, in which case if he's a full-time student, he might still be able to be claimed as a dependent on his parents' tax return. And if that was the case, then the, whoever paid for the school, you would think that it would be claimed on the parents' tax return. If he's claiming his own return, and then obviously he's the only one that can basically claim the credit, even if it was paid for by somebody else, because because he's claiming himself, in essence, uh, as kind of like his own dependent, right? Because he's claiming his own uh, on his own tax return as opposed to on his parents' tax return. And of course, if he had a spouse, then either spouses that went to school can claim them and any dependents then if they are a dependent then typically they could also be going to school and remember that we have that increase or bump up in the dependency level because if they're if they if they're up to 24 versus 19 and a full-time student you might still be able to claim them as a dependent which would be good because then you might be able to get the education credits whereas the dependent themselves probably couldn't get much of a benefit from them given the fact that they're not going to earn any income because they're not earning income, they're going to school full-time is the general idea. All right. All right, so let's enter some general information to start off with. Let's imagine that we have, uh, this is going to be the data input for this software. It'll be similar for other types of software. We got to determine who is this for. Is it the taxpayer or the spouse, for example? We've got the number of prior years, the uh, American Opportunity Credit was claimed. I'm going to say zero in this case. If it was claimed for more than four years, then you wouldn't qualify for the American Opportunity and would have to bounce to the lifetime learning possibly. Student was not enrolled in at least half time uh, for at least one academic period. That's going to be important for the American Opportunity Credit. Student completed first four years to post-secondary education. If they had done so, then they might not be able to get the American Opportunity, but possibly lifetime learning. Student was convicted before the end of 2023 of a felony, felony for possession of uh, drugs or, or something. And once again, that would uh, disqualify you from the American Opportunity, but possibly not lifetime learning. Forced lifetime learning, the educational institution, this would of course be coming from the form 1098T, and it's going to give you the institution and the institution's EIN number. I just made up the cool U here. Uh, 2023 form 1098T was uh, not received, so typically that will not be the case. Usually you will get one if you don't contact the institution and try to pressure them to give you it because you want to be able to take the deduction and the IRS will typically want to see that. So form 1098T received with box 7 completed. So box 7 is this box. Check if the amount in box 1 includes amounts for an academic period beginning January uh, through March of 2025. This is for tax year uh, 2024 for this particular form. That's going to give an indication of the cutoff because remember, and we're usually talking about a cash-based system, but uh, they're always they're concerned about when the amount was paid versus when you've got the actual benefits. Additional institutions attended and then current year expenses. So I'm going to imagine the expenses starting off, we just have it right here, payments received for qualified tuition and related expenses. And I'm just going to say, all right, that was 5,000. I'm not going to put any more for books and whatnot at this point, and we'll just keep it at that. All right, so let's pull it on over to the forms. We can then see that the form, it didn't do anything, right? Page two, nothing happened. Why? because we have an income limitation. So I put 100,000 on the income. If he's a full-time student, then he's doing pretty well uh, at 100,000 and a full-time student. So let's bring the income down to let's say 75,000, 75,000. And then we'll bring it back on over. So now we have page one at the 75,000. The 13850 for the standard deduction getting us to the 61150. And then on page two, we have the tax at 8766. And now we see this 1500 being calculated up top and then another 1000 down here. That gives us the maximum credit for the American opportunity for one individual, or for one student, the 2500. Let's look at the calculation on form 8863. So this is the education credits, the American Opportunity and Lifetime Learning credits. Noting, 
that you can almost think of these as like their one credit, even though they're basically kind of like two laws, because basically you're going to always benefit typically. I mean, I'm pretty, I think every time if you qualify for the American opportunity to take that one. And then if you don't qualify for that, try to get the lifetime learning. If you don't qualify for that, then you might be able to see if you can deduct it somewhere else, possibly on like a schedule C, for example, if you have a sole proprietor business. So we have the refundable part. So this is the refundable American opportunity credit. We're going to look at the bigger one first. So we have after completing part three of, of uh, for each student, enter the total uh, from all parts uh, three. So and the max is 2,500. So you'll so I put uh, 2,500 here, or I didn't put it here. The software put it. Let's let's look at page two. Uh, page two, this is part three, student and educational institution. So here's the student, Adam. Here's the social security number. Here's the institution, cool you. Here's the address. Here's our, our questionnaire uh, to see if they qualify. So did the student receive form 1098T? Typically you will. Did the student receive form 1098T from this institution in 2022? Gonna say no, enter the institution's employer identification number. There it is, name of second one. I don't have a second one at this case. So then we have, uh, has the American Opportunity Credit been claimed for this student for any four prior years? If no, then we continue for the American Opportunity. Was the student enrolled in at least half time for at least one academic period that begins in or treated. So we have to say yes there for the American opportunity. Did the student complete the first four years of post-secondary education? No for the American opportunity to apply otherwise lifetime learning. Was the student convicted uh, before 2023 of a felony uh, for possession or distribution of controlled substances? That's really what the college campuses are for these days is to distribute. That's, <laughs> that's the main business that they're promoting. At the, no, I'm just kidding. But we're going to say no on that one. And again, that applies to, to the American opportunity, possibly not the, not the lifetime learning. So the American opportunity then is being calculated because we qualify for that one. So that's where the expenses are being, being applied to. So adjusted qualified education expenses. Notice I can't go over the 4000 So that means even though I entered 5000 it capped it out at 4000 4000 is the max amount of expenses that will give me the maximum amount of credit, the maximum amount of credit being 2,500. So this is what I was talking about, about it being confusing when you try to compare deductions and credits. Because if I was able to deduct this amount somewhere, I might have been able to get 5,000 of deductions because I actually had 5,000 of expenses, but I would only get a benefit based on my tax rate and usually the credit will be more beneficial because although I could only use 4,000 of the 5,000 to calculate the credit and of that 4,000, I only got 2,500 of actual credits, that 2,500 is being fully uh, beneficial typically, meaning each dollar of the 2,500, I'm getting a dollar benefit from. Whereas if I put the 2,500 as a deduction, I would only get a benefit of the, the amount based on the tax rate, that bracket that we're in. But that's, again, that's not really a fair comparison because if I got the deduction, I might be able to deduct $5,000 and then only get the amount based on the tax bracket. Whereas here, I was limited to only being able to calculate based on 4,000 and then that maxes out my credit to 2,500 2,500 basically being the benefit that I'm going to receive. That pulls into page one. So now we have part one after completing part three, there's the 2,500. And then we have our income limitation. 180 if married filing jointly, 90 if single or head of household. So this is the amount that's coming from our adjusted gross income to calculate that income limitation. Subtract the two, if zero or less stop, you can't take any education credit. Enter 20,000 if married filing joint, 10,000 uh, if single head of household. So if line four is equal to or more than line five, uh, enter one. So we have a one here, less than da 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 da. And so that's gonna be multiplied out. Uh, if you were under age 24 at the end of the year, meet the conditions described, you can't take the American Opportunity Credit. So we have the 2,500. The refundable uh, American Opportunity Credit is uh, the, the, what is this? The refundable American Opportunity Credit multiply line seven by 40% 
enter the amount here. And so there's uh, the 1,000. And then down here, we have the non-refundable credit, which is uh, the non-refundable credit subtract line eight from seven, the 1,500. So in essence, if we go back to the form 1040 page two, we've, we've get this uh, 1,500 for the non-refundable portion, the 1,000 refundable. Now this refundable portion down here is a little bit tricky because it usually when it's down here, you're thinking it's being used as a refundable credit, but it's not really here because we still had tax liability to kind of eat it up. So in this case, like these two categories, it will use this refundable portion, whether or not it's, it's being used as refundable or not. In this case, we could have put the full 2,500 up here and have enough liability to consume it. But the way the worksheets work, they put the non-refundable down here, whether it's being consumed or not by the liability that we have. Okay, so that's the general idea. Now, remember when I compare the two, this is a comparison worksheet between the American Opportunity Credit and the Lifetime Learning. So this one maxes out at 2,500 with the Lifetime Learning maxes out at 2,000 and then the income thresholds and then the refundable or non-refundable. This one has the refundable portion versus the no non, there's no non-refundable over here. Uh, available only if the student had not completed the first four years, available for all four years of post-secondary education for courses to acquire or improve job skills. So let's imagine then that some of these check boxes weren't checked off over here. So now I'm gonna go, okay, duh, 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 duh. let's go to the credits, education credits. So so if we had the, the 5,000, also just realize that if I had this at like, uh, like 2,000 here, that my books might be able to push me over for the American Opportunity Credit more likely to than for the lifetime learning. So if I had another, you know, 3,000 here, then uh, this would be books and supplies required to be purchased from the books and supplies not entered above American Opportunity only. So these are the ones required to be purchased, whereas these might still be here for the American Opportunity, but not for the lifetime learning. So you have to look at the differentiation between those two calculations with regards to expenses that qualify uh, for them. In other words, in box one, uh, if it's the lifetime learning credit, you're more likely to have everything kind of included in here. Uh, but for the American Opportunity, you might have some expenses that you spent on supplies that weren't through the tuition or didn't go directly to the institution and whatnot that possibly could still be deductible, includable, meaning you have more expenses to calculate up here than than for the lifetime learning, but they're still only capped at 4,000, right? Whereas you would need 10,000 for the lifetime learning to to maximize the credit at 2,000. Okay, so so that's just something to keep in mind. So if I go back on over here, I'm going to delete this. Let's put this back up to 5,000. And let's say that we had then, duh, 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 duh. if any of these student was not enrolled in at least half time, let's say that was the case. They weren't enrolled in at least half time. Boom, going back over. So now uh, we only have the non-refundable education credits and we're going to the lifetime learning. So if I go to page two, here's my questionnaire, Adam, boom, 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 boom. And basically non, non qualified for the American opportunity credit, but we have the ability to take the lifetime learning credit at the 5,000 going back to page one, nothing's up top for the refundable American opportunity. We only have the non refundable portion down here. I hope I got those the correct last time. This is the refundable part and this is the non-refundable part. And so all of the lifetime learning is non-refundable. And so now we have the 10,000 after completing part three for the student, enter the total, duh, 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 enter the smaller of 10 or 10,000 because it's capped at 10,000 now, enter the 100 if married, file and joint. And so we're under the cap. So that gives us the 1,000 the 1000 is going to the form 1040 page number two, 
and there is the 1000 it's all up top in the non-refundable there is no refundable portion for the lifetime learning credit now i could notice the expenses are a lot higher here i could go up if i put 15000 of expenses which is quite common to go over that threshold if you're talking about full-time student and one of these you know big institutions that could be quite expensive it's going to cap out at 2000 so now if I go back on over here and we look at this and say, okay, now on page two, lifetime learning credit uh, is the 15,000. And then if it goes to the next page, here's the 15,000, but it capped it at 2000, right? And so we're only getting a benefit of the uh, 2000. So just something to keep in mind, if the credits are important or a big factor in someone going to school to get the benefit of the credits, then if you're taking the American Opportunity Credit, the max amount that you can spend before it starts to not give you any more benefit for the credit is $4,000. And if you're looking at the Lifetime Learning Credit, the max amount that you can expend is 10000 to get the maximum credit of 2000 if you, ha if you have more spending in that year, over 4,000 for one student for the American Opportunity Credit, you might not be getting any more benefit in terms of the credit for those expenses. So that could affect some people if you're trying to maximize the cost of education, you wanna do it really slowly, given the cost of education is quite high right now, where you're like, okay, I'll just do 4,000 a year to maximize the credit to 2,500 until four years have passed and then basically spend 10,000 per year possibly, and then maximize the lifetime learning credit at maybe 2,000 uh, for that 10,000 of, of spending. If, you, if that, you know, that might be the most, be a long time to do it at these really expensive institutions, but just from a cost effective on maximizing your credits, you know, you could think about doing something like that. All right, so that's going to be the same thing for basically if I checked off the student completed the first four years of post-secondary education, same thing. If they had more than four years that they claimed the American Opportunity Credit, same thing. They would bounce over to the lifetime learning. Student was convicted before if, of a felony, if that would bounce them over to the lifetime learning and, and so on. So those would all be things that would take them away from the larger credit to the smaller credit. All right, so now let's say that let's say that they have a dependent. So now I've added a dependent, which I'm going to say is Sam. Sam's their dependent, and I'm going to say that he's a full-time student. So even though he's he's over 19, he's still a dependent, qualifies as a dependent. And now we're going to say that he's the one that's going to school. We'll say it's like the first year, and he had 15,000 of expenses uh, that were on the on the form 1098T. So if I go into my forms, then now we have Adam Taxman, and now he's got a dependent of Sam. So there's Sam. We're not going to get the child tax credit because he's too old for that, but he still might qualify for the credit for other dependents. So that's good. And then on page one, we'd probably be head of household maybe here. So I changed it to head of household. So now dependent, and so now we've got a bit larger of the deduction, 20,800. And then page number two, we have uh, the tax calculated. Now he's got the child tax credit or the other credit, which is only 500 for the other credit as opposed to the child tax credit. But we now have the credits here that are still being calculated, even though it's not for, for the taxpayer, but the dependent. So the 2,500 uh, calculated, same kind of calculation we saw before for the American Opportunity Credit. Now note that because the general rule is that because Sam is being claimed on the parent's tax return, the parent is the one that can typically get the benefit to calculate the tax credits for the amount paid to the institution, even if the amount paid to the institution was paid by like a rich uncle or something like that. The rich uncle d can't get the education credit for Sam because Sam, even though he paid for the, for the schooling because Sam isn't on his tax return and therefore he can't tie the credit out. So it doesn't make sense for the rich uncle to have to pay the parents who have to then pay the institution so that the parents can get the deduction because they can say that they paid for it, right? We can just kind of assume that whoever's claiming the student on their tax return is basically gonna get 
the benefit of possibly getting the credit even though someone else might have actually paid the institution for the actual expenses because somebody should get the benefit it is kind of the general idea that's the general rule now you could have two kids what if we had two kids and they're both going to school so now we've got uh we've got adam taxman head of household status we're going to say and we've had we've got the two kids now and we've got the 75,000 income the the standard deduction 20,800 and then page number two now we've got then the doubling right so we've got the the child tax credit or other dependent is now 500 500 times two or 1,000 and then we've got the the credits here of 3,000 up top for the non-refundable and 2,000 down below so if we go then to our form so here's the education credits so now i'm going to go to page two so now we have sam calculated for the for the 2500 maximum and then down to the next one we have kid two <laughs> which was calculated for the 2500 pulling into the first page which now we have the uh 5000 up top for for a total of 2000 up top and 3000 down below that's a total of 5000 so we've maxed out the credit for both kids of the the 2500 each to 5000 so rem remember that basically each kid then is going to max out if they're taking the american opportunity credit they're not really kids or stop calling them kids man they're they're young adults now okay okay but the idea is that that you could max out four thousand of the expenses to each of them to max out each of their credits related to them of 2500 if we're talking about the american opportunity credits now now you could have one of them maybe one of them no longer qualifies for the american opportunity credit let's say sam here so now let's imagine that one of the students will say, will say kid two, student completed the first four years of post-secondary education. Therefore, they don't qualify for the American opportunity, but possibly qualify for the lifetime learning credit. So if I go back on over then, and we take a look at our forms, we're going to say do, do, do the education credits. We have the two education credits. So this is for uh, Sam. So Sam qualifies for the 2,500 for the American opportunity, but the kid number two doesn't and qualifies for the lifetime learning 12,000 that applies to it for the calculation, which will now be calculated on page one. The refundable amount for the American opportunity, only the one for Sam is the 1,000. And then down below, we've got the non-refundable uh, calculations, which are given us uh, a total of the 3,500. And that would make sense because you would think that we would max out between 2,500 for the one that had the American opportunity plus the 2,000 for the other, which would be 4,500. So there's the 1,000 plus the 3,500. So we're maxing out at 4,500. Basically, that's going to go up to uh, the, the form 1040. By the way, it goes into the schedule three here. So you have the education credits which are flowing into the form 1040 page number two so the 3500 up top and the non-refundable 1000 below giving us a total benefit of the 4500 now if two of them don't qualify for the 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 american opportunity credit then note that there's a difference here in how many people can you, you only get the number of of years number number of tax years credit number of programs required number of courses what's well, actually the first one maximum credit the the american opportunity is 2500 credit per uh, for eligible student whereas the lifetime learning is up to 2000 credit per return that means that you can have multiple people that are on the same return as long as it's the american opportunity credit and be still maxing out for each of those getting the 2,500 per student. You can have 2,500 for a student for the American Opportunity and 2,000 for the lifetime learning for two people on one return, but you can't have basically two people that qualify for the lifetime learning credit and get 
get a maximum of 4,000. It's gonna cap you at 2,000 per return for the lifetime learning. So that's just something to keep in mind as well. All right, let's go back to where we had just one person here. So I'm gonna delete these and I'm gonna go back to the credit and say that we had a credit for education and let's just say it was for the taxpayer this time and we'll say it was for the institution to do it and we'll say the amount paid was uh, the 15,000. Now remember down here when we're saying the qualified tuition we would have to possibly reduce it by the scholarship uh, money that we got. So it might be something like 15,000 and then we got scholarship free money that I'd have to reduce this by like 4,000. And so then the amount that we can actually allocate towards the credit would only be 11,000 in that case. But note, if we're talking about either the American Opportunity or Lifetime Learning, that 11,000 is still over the maximum to maximize either credit. So if I go back on over and look at my maximum calculations, we're still maxing out the credits. So when you're trying to think about like how much can I spend to maximize the credit, you have to take into consideration the free money that you got in terms of, of, uh, of grants and whatnot, reducing the amount. But oftentimes if you paid for a full year, you're gonna have expenses that are over that, especially for the American Opportunity because you're gonna max out the credit per student with 4,000 of uh, expenses, which will usually be eaten up just by the tuition oftentimes uh, in that case, and 10,000 for the lifetime learning. Now, if you were in a situation where you're under 4,000, notice if I had like, like exactly 4,000 here and I was able to get a credit, I was able to get a $4,000 credit versus, and I go back on over and say, that would give me a tax benefit. I'd have a tax benefit of, of course, maximizing that out at the 1,005, the 2,500 would, would give me my maximum benefit for that particular credit. Now, what if all of that money was, was tax free? I got a scholarship for it. Well, then you would think you got a benefit because you didn't have to include it in income. In other words, it wouldn't be included and this line item of income because it's not going to be taxable and you got basically free money. And then it's kind of like you would have to include it in income and then you got a deduction already. The problem is that that deduction might not be as worth as much as uh, the credit. So in other words, let's let's compare this two out. Let's say that if I had over here the, the tax of total tax is now being calculated at uh, let's say uh, 2,818. We've got a penalty, but 2,818 to 2,818. So now let's imagine that I that I go back on over and say, well, we're not going to get uh, the credit. Let's say we don't get the credit, but our income was was reduced because we basically didn't include it in income, which would be similar to like a deduction seven one. Oh, oh, oh. So now I kind of like got a deduction because I didn't have to include it in income of 71,000 and that calculates down and so on, but I don't get the credit. So I got a reduction in essence in income and my total here is now 4,931. So now I have 4,931. And so we have kind of a substantial difference between the two of let me do, 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 of uh, 2113 right so the the deduction and if i look at at the at the rate of that this is going to be this divided by the 4000 gives me a rate of 53% well not, that's not really helping me much but the idea is that the deduction might not give me as big of a benefit. So they tried to give me a benefit by not having to force me to include it in income, but I might not have gotten the deduction. And that's where you end up with this weird situation where it's like, okay, what if some of the scholarship money or so on 
is something that I can apply to room and board, in which case I can elect maybe to include it in income. So, and, and then I can maybe say I've got scholar, other income, scholarship income, which would increase my income over here because I'm, I'm going to apply some of it to room and board or whatever, and then be able to uh, take part of that as the credit. So in other words, the general idea is if you had to include the money in income, then then you might be able to include it in the calculation for the credit. But if it's not included in income, you might not be able to include it for the calculation of the credit, but maybe you can include it in income if you have that weird situation where you had scholarship money that could have been spent on stuff that's not part of the normal expenses like room and board. So you elect to include it in income so that you can then pay the taxes on it, but get the credit, the credit outweighing the deduction. Now, when would that happen? It would only happen up to like 4,000, you know, of, of the credit because the cap is that you're going to maximize the credit out at basically the 4,000, which is a fairly low threshold. So a lot of times what would happen is you would, you would basically end up, if you got scholarships and stuff, you're probably still paying out of pocket. So it's likely that the amount of payments after, after the free money, the non-taxable money will still clear the fairly low threshold of the 4,000 and you'll still be able to possibly maximize out the amount that you paid of the 4,000 to maximize the credit and then still get, you know, some benefit from the scholarship, which would be tax free over and above that amount. But uh, if you come up to a situation where you're calculating the American Opportunity Credit and you have less than 4,000 that has been allocated to the uh, to the credit calculation and there's a scholarship situation, you might look into that and say, okay, is there a situation where I can apply some of that to income with the lifetime learning credit? If the amount of expenses are less than 10,000, you wouldn't be maximizing. And if there's a scholarship situation, that's when you might ask the question of, okay, is it possible for me to include part of this in income so I can get a, a credit versus kind of like the deduction situation?